Welcome to Creekside Online. Our mission is to reach the world with Jesus one person at a time with Christ, community, and compassion. We are so glad that you are joining us today. If it is your very first time, please take a moment to click the link below and fill out an online connect card. We would love for you to stay connected throughout the week and everywhere you go. And the best way to do that is through our church app. There you can watch additional messages and find resources to help you grow in your relationship with Christ. It's free and you can download it wherever you download your apps. For us, church is so much more than just a weekend experience. And we want you to know that there's a place here for you at Creekside. No matter where you're watching today, let's get ready for what God has in store for us. Hello, hello. Good to see everybody here today. Y'all good? Y'all looking good? Y'all looking good? And that's great. You survived the storm, but I'll tell you, I'm sure it's heavy on your heart as it is on mine. All the people that, you know, last week had all these goals and plans and everything seemed normal. And now all of a sudden it's like, what in the world? My house is gone. Everything's gone. Where am I going to go from here? So we want to to come together as a family, as a body of Christ, and to pray for those people. I do want to say also that on the stickers in front of you, you can make a special donation to IDES. It's hurricane relief. You, you'll see a button there, normal place where you go to give for the offerings and, and for the, the ties that you normally bring, but you can make an extra donation on top of that. Our missions team, we budget monies for this kind of thing, and we are going to commit $5,000 to our hurricane relief agency we go to. We choose IDES because it's Christian and it uses churches. They're networked everywhere and hardly any, there's just kind of almost zero administration fees that go to that. So we use IDES and $5,000, but we'd love to give way above that to try and help somewhere. You know, this is this is church people helping church people, but also us being light and being salt in the world where it's hurting and, and hoping to bring the grace of God. And so be praying about what God would want you to give about that. But let's go to our Lord in prayer right now and pray for all those folks. Father, our hearts are burdened. As we look at the, the pictures, we look at the videos, it's just uh, the devastation is, uh, is unbelievable. We think about in the panhandle, some of these families have been hit. This is like the third time this year, God. And we, we don't understand all these things and why we know that it's a broken world. And, and we know that, that oftentimes trouble and pressures and hardships come upon us because of the brokenness. Because when sin entered in, the, the world also is, was subject to demise. And, and so, Father, we do understand that, that it's partly because of that. But now, Lord, we know that there are Christian suffering, there are non-Christian suffering. May the church be the church. May we be full of your love, full of your grace to strengthen those folks. I think about you know, not just Florida, but Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, Tennessee, uh, uh, all, all the way, all the way up, up through uh, just kind of the mountain range there, just kind of just instill people getting rain, Father. So we pray that you would just help people to come together and help us to be the church all across America, Lord, and to shine your light, to shine your love and for your comfort and encouragement and strength today, Lord, we, we plead on behalf of these folks. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Listen, this last week, um, I was, in fact, last several weeks, right? I've been encouraging you, Scripture before scrolling. There it is. Some of you got it. Scripture before scrolling. You know, make sure you listen to the scriptures before you go to that or read the scriptures before your thumb starts doing this thing. And, and I'll tell you, it's, it's amazing. It's so powerful, right? I mean, I will often listen to 
I'll listen to music on the way to work, Christian music. I'll turn, I got like my three or four Christian stations that, stations that I tune to, but also have the, uh, have the news <laughs> network that I go to. You know, I'm always looking for the news. But man, it's been my dedication these last several weeks since I started this. No, I'm going to just listen to your word, Lord. I can tell you, after 40 years of studying the word, looking at the, at the word, there, there's just something, there's just nothing like the, the pure word coming through. And when you open your mind, you open your ears and say, God, speak to me today. He does. And how do you know he's speaking to you? You know it when it kind of burns in your heart. This, this passage kind of reminded me of this uh, Luke 24 that I was looking at. And I was thinking, yes, that's, that's why. It's just so impacting. That's why it's so significant what's, what you've been doing in my heart, God. It's because this pastor's talking about the two guys on the road to Emmaus. Remember, when Jesus shows up, he's been resurrected, and he kind of plays dumb like the old Columbo. You remember Columbo? I love that show, right? He just, huh, he just played ignorant, and, and then, you know, he always comes out and finds the guy. G- Jesus comes along, huh, what's going on? He, he, they're talking to the Lord who's risen, right? And, and, they, and he's, how slow of heart you are, and, and to, to believe and to have faith, and he begins showing them the Old Testament scriptures. And then suddenly, when he takes out the communion and opens it up, their eyes are open. They realize they've been with the Lord. And then he he just disappears. And they go saying, it's true. It's true. What we heard is true. We don't need to be downcast anymore. And then they say what? Didn't our hearts burn within us? Right? That's how you know you got truth when when there's just this fire, this burning that's going on. And God's saying, yeah, that's you. And man, I've been listening 40 years. And always something new comes. There's always some detail I kind of miss. Oh, when you open, you say, God, speak to me. Speak to me in this moment. I think about a guy uh, not too long ago, and he's, he's not in the church now, but I was sitting with him, and he asked some advice, and I said, well, I really think, you know, the Lord would want you to do this and to write this letter. And he was like, oh, you know, and I'm like, okay, but we could also choose. And he, he's like, well, no. What you just said to me, I know it's truth. I know it's from God because it just burned in my heart. And I know I need to follow through and obey that and do that. I just wonder what this world would look like. What what pressures might melt away from our lives if we just opened ourselves up more to the pure word of God. Just listening. I mean, I'm almost through completely the Gospels. I almost don't want to go on to Acts. I want to go back through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John again, you know. But, but I'm going to go through the New Testament, and I'm going to start over again. And here I've been saying 40 years. God's got something unique to say to each one of us, to walk with us, to fellowship with us. And I hope that we'll just, we'll just tune in to that, you know. What you'll find is, is Jesus will be opened up to you as maybe something a little different than you ever thought. Maybe someone different than you ever thought. The Holy Spirit, someone different. It, you know, he'll move beyond. It was he always this lovey-dovey with his flowy, flowy hair and this glowy, glowy radiance like in the, you know, the pictures all the time? <laughs> no! You listen to Matthew 23 and holy smoke, he's laying people out. And then you, you hear his disciples go, yeah, we, we, we didn't dare say anything. We're a little afraid. You know, you, you see, you know our hearts and our motives. We're a little bit afraid to speak up. Know the true Jesus. Know who he really is. And know how he wants to help us, strengthen us with his grace inside to overcome the pressures that are going on in the world and that sometimes we bring to ourselves. That's really what this passage is about today. If you have your Bibles, you want to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. We're moving on to verse 14 and uh, following all the way up to chapter 7, verse 1. And really, I'd say this passage is like the goo be gone of Scripture. Don't you love goo be gone? I love Gooby Gone as much as I love duct tape. I love duct tape. Man, it is a fix, cure all for everything. That light comes on in the dashboard of your car. You just put duct tape on it and it's fine. <laughs> you just go right on like nothing ever happened. Man, and, and this Gooby Gone, this is the Gooby Gone of getting the stickiness of the world 
out of us and, and Christ and him becoming more powerful, his grace becoming more powerful in your life. So I'm going to back up a little bit to, to what we had last week and kind of explain the context of this. Verse 12 says, we are not withholding our affection from you, but you are withholding yours from us. You remember that? As a fair exchange, I speak as my children, open wide your hearts. Also, this is like a parent talking to a teenager going, hey, you know, I'm just trying to save you from pain in the future. Look, open your wide, your hearts. You've been trusting all these other people, but I've been bringing you the grace of God and Jesus. And I've been showing you I'm genuine through all the suffering that I've been going through for the gospel of Christ. Who goes through this craziness and this kind of pain and stuff? When I was, I mean, I was like in the top echelon of training and I didn't need these headaches and I was persecuting the church. And now I'm here to strengthen you. You know, I've poured my hearts out to you. So why are you trusting and looking to these other philosophies, these worldly philosophies? He's like his parent appealing. He says, I've opened my heart to you. Open your hearts wide to me. And guess what? Don't open your hearts to them. You've been opening your hearts to the world. Don't do it anymore. Verse 14, do not be yoked together with unbelievers for what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Now, that's a quote right out of Deuteronomy 22.10. It's this imagery that God said, hey, don't yoke an ox to a donkey. I told the Israelites that. Why? Because they are fundamentally incompatible, right? Oxen generally will listen to you. They'll go in a straight line. They'll work hard. They'll stay focused in the work. Man, donkeys, not so much. In fact, not at all, pretty much. They're kind of feisty. They're strong-willed. A lot of times they do their own thing. He's saying, look, one's going to drag the other down. The world's going to drag you down easier than you dragging it up. I used to go to this passage with the students when I was a student minister, and I would uh, have somebody stand on a chair and somebody down below, and I'd say, I'll pick that guy up. And they struggled to pick this guy up, but then I'd say, now, now you pull them down. Boy, it was so easy to pull them off the chair, right? It's so easy. <laughs> it's so easy to, for one to drag the other down, to get discombobulated. And, and God is trying to say to us, look, sometimes you're bringing the pressures on yourself, because you're just too connected to the world. Now, yes, we got to live in the world, but you're too connected to the world. Because the very word church means, ecclesia means separated ones. We're separate from the world. We're a kingdom, I said, within a kingdom. We're you know, within even a bigger kingdom, the globe, the world, right? We're a kingdom within the United States, which is a kingdom within the world, the global kingdom. But we are alien strangers in this life. First Peter says, and so we're supposed to act like we're supposed to be different. We talked about in verse one and two to be new creations. Don't take the Lord's grace in vain, but we're to act like new creations. And so these people are, are to keep opening their hearts wide to Paul, opening to themselves to the gospel, the goodness of Jesus and to his grace, but don't open yourselves up as much to the world. The same thing that I'm pleading with all of us to do when I say scripture before scrolling. You're going to find yourself so much healthier. I've had so many people who took me up on the challenge to go, oh, my mind is so much clearer than it used to be. I feel full again. I feel strong again where I didn't. Yeah, you, you were just sticky to the world. It's okay. The word is now being that gooby gone. <laughs> it's getting rid of the stickiness of the world that's dragging you down. And we've got almost 200 new Christians. And if you're one of those this year, one of those new Christians this year, you're a new creation in God. Can I just encourage you? The Bible says that you're a saint. It's, it's not this pious thing where you're a statue, going to make a statue of you someday. What it's saying is you are set apart. You are sanctified, meaning two, two meanings in Scripture. You're made holy already, and he's making you holy. He never gives up on us. We've always, we're always a work in progress, and he's working on us until we look like his son, Jesus Christ. Kind of like that marble slab, if it could talk. It would go, ouch, to the sculptor who's pounding away to get rid of that marble. Ouch, ouch, ouch. But the sculptor sees a lion or something beautiful in that, and it's going to get every piece away from it until it looks like what it sees. Jesus sees the image of his son that he created us to be at the beginning of the world when we were DNA and Adam and Eve, and he's going to allow pain and hardship at times. He wants his word sometimes 
to pry those pieces, the ugliness off of us until we look completely, completely like his son, Jesus Christ. And when you let him do that, there's a gentleness, there's a respect, there's a love, there's an intimacy that you share with the one true living God, the almighty, all-powerful God who knows the name of the star farthest in the universe from us, but he also knows your name too, and he knows your troubles, he knows all the past, he knows everything that's happened to you, and he loves you, but there's this tenderness in you, and he's working with you gently, he's a surgeon with you, he's a sculptor with you, kind of removing those parts by bringing convictions to you, where you open yourself up to him and say, yes, Lord, yes, I get it, I need to repent of that too, and every day you're looking to be further walking in his light. And that kind of closeness, man, it needs to be cherished. It needs to be protected. We need to have our eyes open wide to the the craftiness of the evil one. He's so crafty. We get these demands in our heart, these desires. We stop trusting that God wants good for us. And, and, and so we lean into the temptation. Oh, this one time won't hurt. And before long, we've grabbed onto that. And that sin, the Bible says, and that sin, if it's not repented of, it, when it becomes full-blown, it leads to death and destruction. And, and God's speaking to us through this passage saying, don't, don't let that happen to you, man. Resist the devil. One man boasted, I don't have any trouble with the devil. He never bothers me. Another person said to that, yeah, two people traveling down the road the same direction rarely bump into each other. You're right. But man, when you come into the kingdom of heaven, you're not marching down that wide roadway that's all smooth. And you're going against, you're rowing against the grain. You're going against the traffic of everybody else. And there's a headwind there. And the evil ones, every now and then, as he's passing by on the other side, he's going to dangle out a worm just to see if you'll take it, just to slow you down. And what God has in mind for you, for the kingdom of heaven, he's going to put that. He's like, also like a roaring lion, man. You grab onto that thing, and that roaring lion will come in. Remember a passage I read about if you clean the house of one demon and you don't fill it up with something else, right? Seven more worse than the first is going to come in. And so you, you let that little thing, you don't think it's that significant. The Bible says resist him, this roaring lion, and he will flee from you. And people with God's good grace, man, they counter the devil. They counter him every time. That's why I've gotten specific by trying to give you an acronym. And yes, I love acronyms. I apologize for that. Somebody said you should write a book on acronyms. No, because they're just acronyms. They're all out there. It's not original with me, but they do help me remember and help me live a little bit better. But this thing beneath the thing, T-H-I-N-G, man, it's such a helpful acronym. That T, that initial thing, that's trigger, right? The, the things of this world, they trigger us. And they don't have to if we use the last letter of thing instead. G, God's grace, right? That's what that stands for. We lean into his grace instead of the trigger. We pause. I don't, why am I being triggered right now? I don't need to respond with my flesh. I don't need to to grab onto this temptation to be powerful and angry or, or do this fleshly thing. Why am I being triggered right now? I need to lean into his grace. And we talked last week about this prayer. So I want to ask us to pray this prayer together. And I hope you'll lean into it because I've leaned more into it in, in my personal life. It goes like this. Let's read it together. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I welcome everything that comes to me today because I know that it's for my healing. I welcome all thoughts, feelings, emotions, persons, situations, and conditions. I let go of my desire for power and control over those things. I let go of my desire for affection, esteem, approval, and pleasure. I let go of my desire for survival and security. I let go of my desire to change any situation, condition, person, or myself. I'm open to the love and presence of God and God's actions within. Amen. That's a cooperative prayer with God. God, I welcome you. I realize if I try to handle this on my own, I'm going to mess up. So God, I I welcome you into whatever pain's going on. I'm not going to let it trigger me. I'm going to let it 
cause me to fall into temptation and sin. And then <laughs> the H-I-N, right? I told you, T-H-I-N, you're on thin ice because we get triggered and then we hide just like Adam and Eve. And oh dear, we hide and we hurl. We're good at blaming others for what we've done. Man, we're good at hurling the insult onto somebody else. And we hide. Or, or we get really insecure. Oh, if they only knew who I really was. And we put on these masks, which is Hippocrates, hi hypocrites. We become like the, the old theater where they had masks, you know. They wore different masks. The same person could have a different mask. We become one thing on church on Sunday and then another thing tomorrow at school or at work. And we, and we put on these masks, these insecurities. So we got to put on a mask instead of being fully secure in Christ and feeling significant in Him. And so we either act really big or we act small in the insecurity. And we, as a result, <laughs> people don't know how to handle us. They don't know how to deal with us because we're acting all weird sometimes. And Satan kind of gets in there. And then these false narratives, these false stories comes in our minds and, and makes us go from one bad decision to another. Like the, you know, jumping out of the kettle and into the fire so many times. Old country preacher said, can't walk with God and run with the devil at the same time. And so walk with God. Run with God and His grace. I get personal here. What do you run to to hide your feelings? What do you think is going to provide you significance? What do you think is going to provide you Security. Other than God, is God enough? I'll say a resounding yes, but is He enough for you? Is He your all in all? What do you partner with in your emotions? That shows you're trusting the world's ways and philosophies more than God's ways. You're yoking up with something. What is it that you're yoking up with? Let's look at verse 14 again. Do not be yoked together, and it says, with unbelievers. With unbelievers. What he's saying is, don't have this deep fellowship, this partnership. The yoke was that wooden thing that came over people's shoulders. Jesus said, take my yoke upon you, because my yoke is easy, my burden is light. What does he mean? His teachings. And so you become a Christian, you become like him and he shoulders up he takes that yoke on his side and you're much weaker on the other side but at least you're on the same track and you're not going to be rebellious like the donkey you're going to be cooperative with him say your yoke of grace and your way of living i take it up i'm, I'm going to walk with you and you don't yoke up you don't partner deeply like that with the world and it's philosophies. Where does that apply? It applies to business partnerships. It applies to friendships and peers that are at school. You, you, you go to a certain length to try and influence with light and salt, but you don't partner deeply in the long term so that you get pulled down with it. Charles Swindoll used to say, if you got white gloves and you got a muddy garden, and you put the white glove in the muddy garden, does the mud get globby or the glove get muddy? If it's in there too long, you know very well what's going to happen. The same thing with partners, partnering with these philosophies. So you, you, you must be careful. And, and students, college students, this also applies to marriage. You know, somebody said, if you're a child of God and marry a child of the devil, you're going to have a lot of trouble with your father-in-law. <laughs> it's just the way it's going to go. True story. Young football player, Division I football player, is getting, you know, he's engaged to be married, got close to the marriage, and he, and he goes to his preacher, and he's just in tears. He said, I had to call it off because she just told me, just told me that your family's so serious about God and about his church and all this stuff. I get it. But really, I was just raised in my family that it's just pretty much Christmas and Easter is enough for us. 
And he says, I knew where she was versus where I was, and it just didn't seem like I was going to be able to pull her up to what God calls us to, and so I had to break off the engagement. You know, I say good for him. He prevented himself from so many troubles and problems down the road. Was it painful initially? Absolutely. But he chose the right thing. He can't partner with these other things. Look, look at what verse 15 says. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. Yes, the Bible calls us even priests. First Peter Chapter 2, he says, look, you're a holy nation, you're a holy priesthood. And I know this is really shaking the foundation for some of you. Hang with us, because all I'm doing is quoting Scripture. Look up 1 Peter chapter 2 yourself. You're saying, no, no, priest, he's the guy you go confession to behind that, that thing. No, we're all priests who are Christians. God looks at us. What's a priest? A priest is a bridge builder to God. He looks at us as these bridge builders for people to come close to God. And he says, look, you're a royal priesthood. Be careful as you're making the sacrifice of your life. As 1 Corinthians 15, Paul said, verse 33, bad company corrupts good, good character. So be careful you can't have such deep fellowship because you might be led into sin too. So let's talk sin. Sin is this unpopular world, word these days, right? One preacher pointed out that we love to call it a mistake instead of a sin. Missing the mark. Hurting God's heart. It's not just a mistake, but we love to call each other mistakers instead of sinners. Can you own up and say, man, I am a sinner. I own this sin. I've cooperated with the father of lies, and that's what led me to this sin. You know, you go to a football party this afternoon, you get red sauce on your shirt. Are you going to blame the, the party guy for providing that dip that you put your chip in? Or are you going to own it? I'm the one that, that did it. It doesn't matter that you tempted me with that red stuff. And I brought my white shirt of all things. I own it. I messed up. I used to have a friend, seven years old, and he's getting into constant trouble. I said, dude, what are you doing? And he says, the devil just makes me do it. I just don't know, right? The old lie. The old lie. Devil made me do it. No, you got to cooperate with the devil. That's what's going on. You're letting your desires get out of control and your demands for pleasure or for a better life, you're getting them out of control. It's just making it so easy for Satan. He doesn't have to put cake and ice cream in front of you anymore. All he has to do is dangle the worm. Sin happens. And 1 John says if we say we're without sin... We're calling God a liar. We're not just liars. We're calling God a liar. Because all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And all of us need to confess, he says. What is confession? Confession is agreeing with God. I've missed, your mark. I've missed your holy mark. And God, I will fail again without your help. And so I repent. I, which means change your mind. It's, it's not just involving the emotion where you feel sorrowful. It means I'm changing my mind about what led me to that. Those desires and determinations that are out of control, those, those demands that I have for a better life that's out of control, and I've not let God, I put myself on the throne instead of putting God on the throne. You don't do that anymore. Confess. It's the only way to get rid of the triggers. Only way. You gotta confess, you gotta own it, stop denying it. That's the first step of AA, right? Or celebrate recovery. Come on out of denial, man. You got a problem. Everybody else sees it but you. These triggers. Own it. Confess it to God. That's agreeing with Him. God, this thing is bigger than me. It's been plaguing me for the last 10 years. God, without your help. I'm going to keep missing the mark. I confess, I agree. This is not who you designed me to be. I agree with you. Help me now. 
God says in 1 John 2, 15, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So how in love are you with these visions and these dreams that you have that you think are so vital for this very temporary 70 or 80 year old life that you have? Do you love the world so much that you would just sacrifice your soul? That's why Jesus says you must deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. Die to yourself. Follow God. Love him and his goodness and his grace. That's why Romans 12, 2 says, don't be conformed to the world anymore. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's repentance again. God is wanting to transform you into the image of Christ. Don't let that sin, even a little sin. You know, don't, you know, it's, it's kind of like the woodpecker. You see him out there pecking. Oh, he's making these little holes. That's not a big deal to my tree out there. My precious tree, little holes. Oh, that's how a lot of us approach our life with sin. Oh, that's just a little thing. That's just a little thing. That's just a little thing to God. And all of a sudden you got a huge hole in that tree and the first little wind comes in and blows it down. Our, that's our souls. Some of our souls to God. It's like, well, that was little. It's like the BB gun to glass, you know, the, the old houses and guy, kids shoot their BB gun and, oh, that, that's not going to harm it. It's just a little hole in the glass, but enough little holes and suddenly the glass collapses. It might as well just been a cannonball to begin with. Is there something that you've kind of just been in your life going, that's not a big deal. That's just a little white lie. That's not, that's not anything, really. My bottom line today is really let God's grace and holiness and promises, we're going to talk about his promises here in a second, stick like glue so that the load of life isn't unbearable. Or we could do it a positive way. So that the load of life is bearable. Your load and the pressures you're feeling you feel that they're unbearable because you don't have enough of God in you yet. I hate to break it to you, but you've got to trust him. You see the martyrs and all those people, you go, how did they do what they did under such pressure? How did they stay faithful to God? Well, guess what? They had a living, vibrant relationship with God. That's how. He was bigger than the pressure inside of them. That's how they glorified God with their life. They trusted the promises of God. What are these promises? Real quickly, let me go through them. The promise of God's residence within. Is he, is he a walking companion within your life? Verse 16, as God has said, I will live with them and walk among them. I will be their God and I will be their people. They will be my people. I will be their God. They will be my people. I'll be with them. I'll walk with them. Just as he walked with the Israelites, he wants to walk with us. But even deeper, he wants to live inside of us. Jesus said, I got to go away so I can send you the advocate, the helper for you. He's a counselor. He'll be with you. When's the last time you reached out to him like you reach out to Jesus? Jesus says, he, he's here. He's the counselor. He's the comforter. When's the last time you said, Holy Spirit, I'm in this struggle right now. Help me out. I know you, you want to walk with me. And, and by the way, if there's any sin hindering it, I'm, I'm denying it right now. I'm getting rid of it right now. I want to approach something that I think gets a lot of us into trouble, and that is we, we think that being bit, that doing is more important than being. So if you want Jesus walking with you, I always want to go back to the basics here of we're human beings, not human doings. So God gave us, you know, a Sabbath rest. God himself rested as a pattern for us. We're to rest with God at least one day a week where we focus on him. Are you doing that? And then that work comes out of that. What I share with people is, is at a bare minimum, we have Christ, community, and compassion up there as a balanced life, right? You're spending one to two hours a week in worship with his saints. You're in community in small groups with each other, and then you're serving. That's compassion. One or two hours with somebody else in a week. That's a minimum. But the most it should be as us together is probably 10 hours. That's the most in Christ, community, and compassion. Together, some of you are spending too much time at this church building. Can I just say that? And you're robbing other people from their chance to serve here. 
You're doing way too much, and you need to set boundaries. You need to start saying no. And I'm kind of giving you permission right now. Don't jump off the ledge. Get an apprentice or somebody to help. You know, we don't need to lose all our teachers all of a sudden here. But what I'm trying to do is say there's a balance of walking with God, and then the fruits come. We're robbing other people of this, and, and people get out of balance. And so if you're, you're doing more than 10 hours beyond your work life here at the church, it robs you of also being salt and light in the community. And salt isn't very effective if it stays in the, the salt shaker. Jesus said you're salt. If it loses its saltiness, it's only good for the, the pile. And salt's supposed to flavor. It's supposed to preserve society. So you got to be in society. I'm going to explain this and how this balances out because you're like, you thought you were telling us not to be in the world, that kind of thing, to hate the world and all this stuff. No, we're going to balance it in just a second because scripture balances scripture. But you, you got to have that time where you're also building into your family, Christ. You're opening the word of God with your family. Do you have that? Half an hour, an hour? Or like, I would open in New Living Translation to my boys and read through Proverbs, or, or we would do uh, Experiencing God together, where, or, or we would just read through the New Testament, and I'd let them ask questions. What, what's going on with that? And if I didn't know the answer, I said, I'll get the answer. I'll bring it back to you tomorrow. What are you afraid of? Walk with God. Invite him to walk with you. And then look to bless others. We have this app. I wish we had it when my kids were growing up. This, this app, Bless Every Home, which is so cool. Begin with prayer for your neighbors, those around us. If you're always at the church, you're not spending any time building relationship with your neighbors to bring them to Christ. I'm not saying go deep with them into sin. Again, we're supposed to influence to a point. But begin with prayer and then listen to their needs and then eat with them and then serve them and then share your story with them. It's usually the fifth thing. Before you get to sharing and, and saying, hey, you need to come to church with me, spend some time with them so they can trust the message in you. Jesus says, my yoke is easy, my burden's light. Then the second promise. It's of his welcome reception of you. As, uh, as you're cooperating, you become like this bride in his sight, and he's just so attractive, man. He comes to you. This is just an amazing thing. God says, therefore, come out of them and be separate Touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you. And of course, there's the question. So how separate are we to be of the world? If I receive Christ's grace this way, am I supposed to reject the world? Well, yes and no. Again, avoid extremes. You've got to be in the world, but not of the world. We're still to be grace and truth to the world. A balance of both. <laughs> Tolerance. This word tolerance today goes way too far to the grace side. There's no truth with it. It's got to be the full-on balance of 100% grace, 100% truth. And Scripture interprets Scripture. So let me go ahead and Paul's own words to the First Corinthian church to help explain this. First Corinthians 5, verses 9 through 13, in the message paraphrased by Eugene Peterson, he says, I wrote you in my earlier letter that you shouldn't make yourselves at home among the sexually promiscuous. I didn't mean that you should have nothing at all to do with outsiders of that sort. You see that? There, there is a sense in which, yes, we, we keep relating with them. Or with criminals, whether blue or white collar, or with spiritual phonies for that matter. Why, you'd have to leave the world entirely to do that. But what I am saying is that you shouldn't act as if everything's fine. If somebody in the church is putting on those masks and they keep sinning, they keep just, who cares what the church says? I'm receiving God's grace and they're not repenting. He's saying, no, those people you need to talk to, you need to confront them. But I'm not telling you to completely leave the world. You, you, you need to influence those people making a beeline on the road to hell. You need to influence them and, and tell them that's the most loving thing that you could do is say, hey, there's a bridge up there that's out and you're going to jump over it into the lake of fire. Please don't do that. Please. And that means it's a fine line. That means it's a very careful line. A college uh, with an established football team wanted a mascot, so they decided to get a goat. And the question was where to keep the goat. 
And so two of the students offered that the goat could be kept in their bedroom. And a director of sports department got wind of that. So he approached the two students and he said, well, I hear you're going to keep the goat in your room. What about the smell? And one of the students replied, the goat will just have to get used to it. <laughs> Are you doing your best to clean yourself up so that God can receive you? Are you doing your best to be the bride of Christ? And you're not acting like the mess and the smells of this world? Are you loving with grace and truth? Verse 18, this is the last promise. And I will be a father to you. You will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. I know this is a tough one for some of you. This promise that God is this good, good father. Friends, I don't care how bad of a father you have. Get to know the father of scriptures. He's not this harsh father that so many think he is. Yes, he's, he's like that parent of the teenagers going, no, 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 don't go down that road because I don't know, it could just, there's a bridge out. God says, here's the line. I want you to understand my holiness He's a good, good father, and he's so full of nurture and love and tenderness. And if you, if you could accept this, he's, he's like this divine surgeon that is also a father. Imagine that you had a surgeon, and, but they're also your parent. Don't you know that they would take the, the deepest of care to get rid of every cancer cell that they could find in your body that was ravaging things? Well, God is like this father surgeon he's divine and yes he have you ever gone to a surgery man they have you clean up the day before <laughs> the day of they have you clean up you go into that upper room it's freezing cold and they've sterilized everything right what surgeon in his right mind would say no it's okay that the scalpel's rusty and it's okay it's okay that they haven't cleaned themselves up what kind of a caring surgeon would that be god says look cooperate with me. I will show you how to have healing and how to have power and how to have strength. And I will keep operating on any of that cancer that's trying to get in your body, that's trying to bring destruction. And I will do it tenderly. And sometimes it'll feel hard. That's Matthew 23 to the Pharisees where all the woes and the harshness and to the disciples, sometimes it'll feel hard. The scalpel will seem to hit a nerve, but it's only because he loves you. He doesn't want that sin to take you down. He's a good, good father, full of grace and full of truth. Let him be that doctor. Verse 1, in conclusion, therefore, since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and soul, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. Cooperate with God. We can't be holy without his help. Open yourself up to him. Open yourself up to his scriptures. Trust his scriptures. Just take sexual sin, for example. 1 Corinthians 6, 18 talks about the fact that those who get involved sexually outside of God's parameters sins against his own body. In some way, you're hurting yourself in a deeper way than you could imagine. You're sinning against your own body, against your own soul. God's trying to protect us from that. He's, in marriage, man, the sex gets more beautiful as time goes on, as you get deeper and deeper in love with each other. You're missing out if you go outside the, the parameters. That's why Hebrews 13 would say, look, marriage should be honored by all, and the marriage bed kept pure. Are you being tempted? Are you being pressured by the world? Isn't it time today to recognize the roaring lion for who he is and invite God's good grace in? Revelation 3.20, look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in and we will share a meal together as friends. Those who are victorious will sit with me on my throne just as I was victorious and sat with my father on his throne. You can begin the victory today. You can walk a life of power and strength that will overcome any pressure in your life. You just need to welcome, 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 God. I will make room for you, God. I will make room for you to do whatever you want to, 
to let the scripture burn on my heart so that I might be fully in the image of your son. So as we come to this time of communion today, I want you to take that same posture with God. God, let it burn in me. Whatever is hindering your spirit from being full in me, for you to walk with me and talk with me and and be as a good, good father to me and tenderness and love, whatever it is, expose it right now, God. Open me up because I want to be rid of this cancer. I want to show the world how good you are. If you didn't get a chance to take your elements, if you'll raise your hand right now, and this is an open communion to anybody that believes that Jesus is the answer. He says, this is real food for you. My body, my holy body, the way I live my life, my blood that was sacrificed for you, the forgiveness of sins is offered to you. This is real food. My real presence is food for you. Come to me. I welcome all who will come in sincerity of heart. Thank you so much for being here with us today. We hope the message you just listened to had an impact on you. Make sure to stay connected with us through the week online at creeksidechristian.com and on Facebook and Instagram at Creekside Christian Church. We believe God has something unique to say to you. And our hope is that you feel his love stronger today than ever before. We love you and we'll see you next time. Thank you.